Hey church family, I'm so glad you've joined us today. Wow, what a great time of worship, praising the Lord together. Yes, I'm still in my living room, you're in your place, apartment, house, wherever you may find yourself here in Dallas or around the world. But I just want to talk today. The question we're going to ask today is, hey, what does love look like? particularly in this particular cultural moment. What does love look like while sheltering? But also patterns that we're going to uh, continue on in our lives as we get back to normal, whenever that might be. I want to just say this. I'm so proud of you. Oh, way to go, church family. You're staying connected across all of our uh, different platforms. And, and each time that we come together, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, as we dive into this uh, sermon today. But the first thing I want you to do, you can grab a Bible. Um, grab a real Bible somewhere in your home there. Uh, put away other divi- you know, digital things and such that might be distracting. Great. Gather the kids around as best you can. And uh, we're going to turn to the book of John here in just a moment. But before we get there, I just want to say again, you've been devoting yourself to your church family. That's so important right now. I would argue your church family has never been more important. Uh, as, you're, as you're hearing a million voices, if you're online, many of us in front of our screens now more than ever. We need some time and space away from those things as well. But I uh, want to say this again, we're redefining, rediscovering church in a lot of ways. Uh, I love our gatherings and I miss you so much. Uh, I cannot wait to be together. We're not going to be together for Easter Sunday. It's hard to believe. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and call it now. When we come together, whenever that might be, and we'll keep you posted, uh, it's going to be Easter Sunday. I cannot wait. And I want you now to commit to being with us on that date, whenever that is. But I want to say uh, this, you know, we're rediscovering church. And what I mean is this, uh, you know, ecclesia, the biblical word for church means called out ones, ones who've been called out by God and out into the world. We say it often, we gather to scatter but the word church actually comes from an old German word, which means which is kert, uh, and it means uh, house. Uh, it literally, means Lord's house. Is when we talk about the church, it's the Lord's house. But but there, the word church became it came to mean a place, a building. That's why people say, "Did you go to church?" or "How was church?" Um, as if the church is not a movement of called out people devoted to Jesus and his kingdom, bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So it's just interesting to be processing a lot of this. Uh, It's challenging what some of us have maybe come to believe church is all about. So in the primal expression of church, if you will, ecclesia, it's a group of people, small group generally around the world who are gathered around Jesus and his word. And that's happening across the board. It's been amazing. We've had record numbers in our connect groups. Uh, Of course, what else are you going to do? Where are you going to go? But way to commit to your group. A lot of you are listening now uh, on all of our platforms. Some of you are even by telephone right now. And it's fantastic that we're all connected here. But uh, continue to stay connected in your, your Zoom meetings, your groups. I dropped in on a couple of them this morning. Fantastic stuff. We've got all kinds of opportunities for you, for your children. Shout out to Paige and Carol Strong for all they've done for We Worship, for our littlest worshipers among us across the board. Our kids, our students, so grateful. And you're the ones that are helping make this happen. Uh, And thank you to our great staff who are working so hard these days. Uh, But we've been practicing the way of Jesus. How providential it was that God would allow us to have this Lenten devotional all the way through this season. Now, this week we we finish it out. This is Holy Week. So I want to talk about just a couple of things we're going to do uh, throughout Holy Week. You can join me midday live. Uh, You've heard about that. Uh, As I'll be walking us through each day, walking with Jesus to the cross through Passion Week and the Scriptures. So join me each day. And then on Palm Sun, on uh, next week, on Good Friday, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, how we can share in the Lord's Supper together. That's become a very special time for us as a church family. And um, we're going to have an opportunity. I'm going to guide us through the Lord's Supper on Good Friday. So you can be making preparation for that. Uh, Jesus had his disciples do the same. But uh, all you need is if you can get some grape juice. Uh, Stacy and I have some cran grape here. That'll work. Uh, of course, Jesus and his disciples, they used wine. You can get um, water will be fine. We're not going to go soft drinks or something. But if you are going to the grocery store, think about that. Uh, you have some bread, perhaps, or crackers. But I'll be guiding us there. Prepare your heart towards Good Friday, this coming Friday, 
as I'll be walking us several times along the day where we'll be able to share in the Lord's Supper together. So be preparing your heart for that special time. I have something special for the kids too. Uh, I've done a drawing uh, of that first Easter uh, Sunday morning for all the children. So we want the kids to be coloring uh, and then you can hashtag PCBC together and we're going to capture those pictures and we're going to put you taking a picture with you and your picture that you've drawn uh, for next Easter Sunday. We're going to celebrate with our kids. But uh, I want you now to turn with me to John chapter 18. That's the passage we'll be looking at, John 18. As we head into Easter week, and I want to ask the question again, uh, what does love look like? And, and to answer this question, we're going to look at a conversation that took place on the morning prior to Jesus' crucifixion. It's a conversation. It's, a, it's actually a legal interrogation that he has with Pilate, uh, Pilate and Jesus, and I want, to sh- I want you to see this morning that love, sometimes love looks like waiting. Love looks like, love looks like dying. Love looks, of course, like Jesus. So he's been arrested. He's in custody after trial. And now it says in verse 33, look at that, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, all four Gospels ask this question. Uh, This is probably the formal charge that was brought uh, upon him. It was brought by the Jews. So he's asking them the question, probably in a derogatory sense. Jesus, there's nothing that looks regal about Jesus in this moment. Uh, Little does Pilate know, consider the irony, that uh, the King of Kings is standing before him. The Messiah, God come to earth. Jesus never claimed to be king, interestingly. He claimed to be the Messiah. But in order to really, you know, work together with the Roman authority to bring about capital punishment, they needed to construe uh, the actual claims of Jesus as king, and they left out or diminished, downplayed all the other aspects of Messiahship. So Pilate had heard that he had claimed to be king, and this was punishable by death. Because there was only one king, you might know. There was only one Lord, he was called. It was Caesar. And anyone who claimed that there was another king could be put to death. Uh, This is why early believers, right? We've talked about this. uh, When they said, Jesus is Lord, consider that. Jesus is Lord, the proclamation of the believer. That was punishable by death. And even today, it is a countercultural statement, proclamation, and life. And, and, and it is radical, and yet that is how we bring witness to Jesus, is by proclaiming and living with Him as Lord of our lives. Now look at verse 34. Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say this about me? Jesus is not being evasive. He's really clarifying the question. Because here's the thing. If Pilate is saying what others have just told him, Uh, then he's just a pawn. And really, we're seeing him being played as a pawn throughout, really by God himself, ultimately. Jesus is running the show here. But if if Pilate himself came to this conclusion, then he's getting closer to the the truth than he realizes. And, And so Jesus asked him the question, but look at what he's doing. I want you to see how Jesus is seeking to win over his adversaries to the truth. Jesus is more concerned about his accusers coming to truth about himself than he is about his own well-being. You see, Jesus is showing us even here how to speak to those who do not believe. We might call Pilate an atheist in our day. And he is saying, hey, here's what's happening. Pilate's the one who's spiritually imprisoned, not Jesus. Pilate's the one who needs the truth. And so Jesus is inviting him in to some self-discovery as he has this conversation with him. So watch what what, uh, Pilate answers. He said in verse 35, am I a Jew? He's saying, well, how how would I know any of this? Uh, You're asking me questions because Jesus now becomes the interrogator. How about that? He shifts it, flips it. uh, And I've said it often. The new apologetic today is the question, is asking the right question, not having all the right answers but to ask the right questions that lead people who don't know Jesus into a corner realizing they don't have the answers and yet he is and we point them to him. So he says, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Pilate saying, what have you done that's so bad that your authorities would bring you all the way to me? And then in verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting 
that I might be might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. See, the source, here's what he's saying, not of this. He's saying the source of, the root of my kingdom is not the world. In fact, the very root, the origin of the kingdom that he's a part of, is, it comes from the very heart of God. You see, he's, he's, not, he's not of this world, but his kingdom is very active in this world, even as it is today. I want you to see, this first point I want you to see, that, is that sometimes love looks like waiting. Consider the patience of Jesus here. You see, this is the king of kings standing before a little puppet ruler uh, of a diminishing, disappearing empire over time. He could have laid Pilate out right there. I mean, he could have wiped out the palace. In fact, the night before, just the night before, he was arrested. A group of soldiers came. You might remember the story. Uh, and just the disciples are there, a couple, a few of them. And, and, the, and the soldiers come armed, ready to take Jesus and arrest him. Pa, uh, Peter jumps out, impetuous Peter, takes on a sword, and he's going to take on all of these soldiers. Imagine that, kids. He takes, out an, he takes out a big sword, and Jesus says, no, 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 no. This is not how my kingdom will advance. Not by power of man, not through violence. Uh, it's not going to come through military force. And he says this. He says, don't you know, this is what he said the night before. Don't you know that I could call, my father could send, uh, he, he says, 6,000. He says 12 legions of angels. Uh, legion was 6,000 Roman soldiers. So 6 times 12, kids, do the math. 72,000 angels, Jesus says, I could call right now to come and wipe these guys out to take care of business. And he could do the same right here in front of Pilate. But he's saying, my kingdom not of this world. And, and it's not going to come as you think it might come. Check out the patience, the waiting of Jesus, because he knew something greater was about to happen because he knows how this story is going to end. And we do, too, friends. We, we know how the story ends as we give our lives to him. But sometimes love looks like looks like waiting. Think about it. Here we are waiting. All of us are, are united in waiting. But I want you to think with me again. What are we waiting for? Many are saying, well, I'm waiting on this to peak and for this virus to leave us alone. I'm waiting to get back to work. I'm waiting to make some money. I'm waiting to see how God's going to come through for me. I'm waiting to go back to school. I'm waiting to whatever you're waiting on. Uh, it's interesting in this moment that there's much to learn. I want you to remember that we are waiting. We're sacrificing in our waiting. Have you seen the stories of the, the heroes on the front lines? Surely you have. You can see their faces. Uh, doctors and nurses who are on long, long, uh, you know, moments and hour upon hour shifts where they're serving the sick, serving the ill. In fact, I know a story out of our own church. There's one of our own members who has been tested positive. And then he discovers that a daughter of other members of our church is his nurse who wanted to serve uh, on the COVID-19 floor. So she said, please put me there. I want to serve. And she ends up being his nurse, praying with him as he goes into, how about this, sedation into and on a ventilator for days on end. These are the heroes. Maybe you've seen the, the picture of, of the doctor who represents so many doctors and nurses who go home then to see their families and they can't be with them. Uh, it's heartbreaking. These are the heroes. This is why we're waiting. We're waiting to, to save lives. So continue to wait. Because sometimes love looks like waiting. Jesus waited. But consider how waiting is an act of love. Sometimes uh, waiting or love sounds like silence. Uh, we, we, we're, we're quick to listen slow to speak, and now we find ourselves in close proximity with each other. Sometimes it means not arguing, not seeking my way, not having to be right. Sometimes love just looks like waiting. Sometimes it means that, that we wait for others to grow up spiritually or physically. Parents, don't expect your preschooler to be an elementary age kid. Don't expect your elementary age student or middle school student to be a high school student. Sometimes we wait 
in love. We wait, uh, even as adults, you know, parents, you're the adult. Be slow to anger. Be, be quick to love. Leverage your authority. This is what, God, what Jesus is teaching us here. Leverage your authority for the sake of others. See, love waits for friends. Uh, love waits to get married. You see, true love waits for the Lord. It waits on Him. And sometimes love looks like waiting. And, and that's why love is patient, is what Paul says. So Jesus says His kingdom is not of this world. And watch this. He says His servants would be fighting for Him if it was the case. So many times, Jesus' servants stop, uh, they stop serving and we get lost in the trivial stuff of fighting. So here's what happens. When servants don't serve, they fight. When fishermen don't fish, they fight. And we're seeing this now, even now. Have you not, have you not experienced this? Who's going to take out the trash? Whose turn is it to do the dishes for the hundredth time this week? Who's going to do that chore or this? You see, we get into this you know, kind of argument here that instead of just serving... So let's just outserve each other, outgrace each other. The kingdom comes through those who serve. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. Not being, not being first, but being last. Not being the strongest and the loudest. By sometimes just being the quietest, the most gentle among us. Look at verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. It's as if, and another way to say that, he said, You're the one that keeps... Keeps saying, King, not me. For the purpose I, for this purpose I was born, Jesus says. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate is just kind of befuddled here. He's blown away. He says, Pilate just asked him, what, what is truth? So Pilate asked, so you are a king. One, one commentator noted, he's really asking, so are, wait, are you my king? And, and yet Jesus, notice how love looks like waiting, but it doesn't mean that he's not moving. He's not at work. He's not idle. Love proclaims truth. Check this out. Jesus is, is not just idle being silent completely. He's pointing now to the truth. Because you see, truth or love without truth is just sentimentality. But truth without love, that's harsh legalism. But truth with love, you see, expresses the truth to others who need to hear it. Love proclaims truth. How about that? Even now, we can proclaim the truth of God. And many of us are thinking, well, you know, a lot of people are thinking about even life and death, thinking about life in these days. Friends, it's a great opportunity to share the truth with loved ones around you. Some of you might be saying, well, I've been waiting. I've been waiting on God, you know, to, to give me an opportunity. No, God's waiting on you is what's happening. So there's a time love waits. There's a time that love moves forward to proclaim the truth. You see, the kingdom of God is not simply advanced by serving others. It's when we serve that we point them and proclaim that we're doing this in the name of Jesus. He's the one that is guiding us. He is the truth, right? Look at what Jesus didn't say. He says, what's truth? Are you kidding me? I am. How about this? Uh, you're looking at him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus doesn't say this. But Jesus does say, if you listen to my voice and obey, then you're one of mine. And you see, many of us, we, we're not praying as we should, perhaps. We're not listening to the voice of God. Are you in His Word? Think about that. Are you truly in His Word? That's how we hear His voice. If you're not, then you're probably listening to everything else that's coming at you on your screens and everywhere we've got all this news coming at us, and it creates anxiety. But know the truth. We've got to know the truth. Look at this. Knowing Jesus means dying to my own truth, laying my own truth down, and, and listening to Him. He alone is truth. Have you given your life to Him? Is He the one who speaks truth into your life? Look at verse 38. And after He had said this, He went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no, no fault in Him. So then, then He offers uh, the people to decide, because one man could be released, it was a custom, at Passover. And of course, you may know the story, they choose Barabbas over Jesus. And then he's taken away and flogged, beaten, whipped, almost to death. 
But I want you to see, not only does love look like waiting, Jesus is on the move. I want you to look at John 19. Just continue now another conversation here because it continues on. John 19, verses 8 through 15. Jesus has been flogged now. He's been whipped, again, almost to death by professional torturers. They've stripped him. They put a crown on his head and a purple robe on him, and they're mocking him as king. And and, and now they brought him back to Pilate, who presents Jesus to the chief priests, thinking, surely they'll let him go. Surely this is enough. And so he just says, behold the man. Like, look at him. And then in verse 8, look at what it says. When Pilate heard, oh, then they, then they cried out, yeah, crucify him instead. They, they had no empathy, no, no sympathy. Crucify him. He claimed to be the son of God. And then it says in verse 8, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now, what, what, what does this mean? He's either, either he's, he's thinking, wow, he's claiming to be God. Maybe he's one of the gods um, in this confusing, um, you know, uh, kind of, polytheism that that uh, he would have understood or maybe he's thinking probably atheist essentially uh thinking instead oh my gosh this guy's not helping himself out at all and i'm gonna have to end up sentencing him to be put to death but instead of doing the right thing Pilate goes along with the crowd because he's more interested in in himself than he is in doing what's right we find ourselves that way at times uh, we we won't, won't go against the crowd. We won't go against culture or friends. Instead, we, we must stand up for Jesus and do what is right because he's always going to be on the right side of history. Now look at verse 9. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? So now it's the two of them again, it seems. But Jesus gave him no answer. Again, Jesus is not avoiding the answer. That's not a simple, simple answer. That's not a simple question. Is Je- think about it. Is Jesus from Bethlehem? Yes. Is he from Galilee? Yes. Is he from Nazareth? Uh, yes. Is he from heaven? Yes. So then in verse 10, so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do, do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? See, Pilate is basically saying, no one talks to me like this. Or maybe no one doesn't talk to me like this. Look at the irony again. Pilate thought he had authority over Jesus. He's confused about what authority really is, isn't he? As it relates to Jesus and the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has greater sin. Now watch this. Pilate has the wrong idea about authority like a lot of us do. In the kingdom of God, Jesus is showing us here and throughout his life that we leverage our authority. And all of us have some cultural authority. Uh, You're in some form of leadership. If you're in authority or have some cultural power somewhere along the way, you've been given that power to advance the kingdom of God. To serve others is how that happens. You've been blessed to be a blessing. You may be uh, a parent. You may be a teacher. You're a coach. You're in some position or role. Maybe you're in the church, a leader or some position. You're serving in some way. You've been blessed in order to be a blessing. In the kingdom of God, we take our privilege and we, we use it for the sake of others. That's why so many of you have been so generous always and during this time as we've sought to serve those who are in need at Vickery or at Cornerstone and other places around our city. Sometimes love looks like waiting, but I want you to see this. Sometimes love it looks like dying because that's what we see here now. Dying to self, your own authority, your rights, your plans. Long before Jesus died, he lived a life of self-denial, literally laid himself down for others throughout his life. You know, we all know that where this story goes, he's going to end up experiencing uh, what you could call a cross death. But Richard Foster says that Jesus lived across life and we're called to do the same. That is that we, we give up our rights in order to serve others. Watch Jesus. Watch him as he calls out this group of backwoods, you know, uneducated fishermen types to follow him as a disciple to follow this rabbi. 
Watch him as he uh, early on cares for everybody at the wedding at Cana. Watch him bless and heal the blind man. Let the lame man walk again. Watch him as he feeds the hungry. Watch as he stands with the oppressed. How he honors the poor. How he has meals with outcasts. And how he becomes a friend of sinners. Watch him serve those who've been rejected. Even those who betray him. Watch him on the cross. Watch him serve his mom. Watch him forgive those who are killing him. Watch him love the dying thief. Watch him die. But watch him as he serves all the way to the end because that's what love does. Every follower of Jesus is to do the same. Is that how your life is described? As one who is leveraging whatever you've been given to serve others. And friends, I'm telling you, in that is freedom. To decide that I have given my life to serve others. I've already made that decision. Look at verse 12 as we come to an end. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. You see the irony? The Jews didn't believe this at all. But they decided to co-opt the government, right, to align with political power in order to get their thing accomplished. Uh, Now, we see a little bit of that even in our day, don't we? seeking their will, their agenda to be accomplished. But look at verse 13. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic, Gavatha. See, ironically, Pilate sits on the judgment seat and he's judging the Messiah. See, one day, Jesus will sit on a greater judgment seat And he will judge every person who ever lived. He will judge you and he will judge me. Not based on our good works, but based on what we have done with him. So friend, if you've never received the grace of Christ, this is why the Lord brought you here to listen to this. There's only one way to heaven and it's Christ alone. He alone died on the cross for your sin. He alone has served you an opportunity to come to Him and to know Him. Could it be that during this coronavirus, God is drawing you to Himself? I want you to see here, before we end, I want you to, want you to give your heart to Christ even now. But watch this. Watch what happens. By sitting down, Pilate is saying he's about to render his official ruling. And it says in verse 14, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. I believe it was really preparation for the Sabbath, kind of a weekend event. It was about the sixth hour, so it's noon, so it's starting to turn toward the afternoon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So now he, instead of behold behold the man, he's saying, Here he is, here's your king. He's really taunting the Jews. Because before them stands now a beaten, bloodied, naked man who stands before him and he's basically saying, this is the only king you'll ever have. And ironically, before them stands the Messiah, the King of Kings. Look at verse 15. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar, which again is a joke. But then look at verse 15. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Because look at this, sometimes love looks like dying. And this is, friends, the Christian life. You you and, and me, to do the very same thing every day. We lay our lives down. We, we give up our privileges, our, our preferences for the sake of others. And this is where, listen, this is where life, joy, and happiness is truly found in serving others. Think about it. Have you ever known a self-centered, happy person? They don't exist. And and so look at, at what this says here. Jesus, when he calls us, if you've received him, and if you haven't, listen to this. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, he said to all, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. I mean, he's very explicit at the very beginning. Bonhoeffer says this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Sometimes love looks like waiting 
Sometimes it looks like dying. I want you to see that uh, the Christian life is what someone called uh, first person post mortem. It's described this way by Paul in Galatians 2.20. Let's all read this together as we close our time. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, listen, love looks like waiting. Love looks like dying. Love looks like Jesus. So here's the challenge for us today on this Palm Sunday. Be like Jesus. And the only way we can be like him is to receive His grace, to live in His power, His Spirit guiding us to serve others. And in so doing, we advance the kingdom of God and point it to the one who has ultimate authority. Love looks like Jesus. Let's be like Jesus. Let's pray together. Friend, if you're, uh, again, listening, I want everybody to just bow your heads and pray with me. If you've not received Christ, You can do so right now. Just ask Him to come into your heart. He alone will bring you salvation. Only through Him can you go to heaven and experience true life here on earth. Someday you'll be judged for your sin. And only Christ can be the one who mediates between uh, between Himself, you, and the Father so that you can uh, find your way to the Father. And to know Him and to live for Him. Just say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. I give you my life. And Lord, we all together now, we give you our lives here on this day. We praise you for what you did for us on that Good Friday that we'll celebrate this coming week. But we celebrate it every day as we die to ourselves and live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen.